everyone. Welcome to the Trial Site News podcast interview series. I'm Dr. Aaron, your host, and today we will be chatting with Dr. Robert Lewis. Dr. Lewis, thank you so much for joining us via audio. Happy to be here. Yeah. And just so you guys know, we're going to be talking about a new type of technology, a new product uh, that uses virtual reality for pain management, specifically back pain. I think I got that right. Um, but Dr. Lewis, let's start out. Do you mind sharing with our viewers a little bit about you and what you do? Yes. Th thanks for having me today. Um, my name is Dr. Rob Lewis. I'm the chief of neurological surgery at Hogue Hospital in Newport Beach, California. Um, in, in addition to my expertise in minimally invasive brain tumor surgery, one of the things I focus on is developing new technologies, uh, including virtual and augmented reality, uh, for use both inside the operating room as well as treatment of other conditions uh, that are non-operative in nature. Really interesting. So let's talk about uh, this new virtual reality product it was recently, I believe, approved by the FDA. Um, so do you mind talking a little bit, starting with the basics, what is it, what are the elements, how does it work? Absolutely, so virtual reality technology has been around for around 30 years, uh, originally being used by NASA astronauts to simulate you know, space flight. Uh, in more recent years, including over the past you know, 10 or 15 years, there's been more and more of a push to implement these technologies in the medical arena. Up to this date, there have been more than 500 published clinical trials demonstrating the efficacy of virtual reality technologies for the treatment of both acute and chronic pain. Now, considering the scope of the problem of chronic pain and the opioid epidemic that the nation is facing, I think this is a great target for uh, physicians and other healthcare practitioners to focus on. One of the, uh, however, kind of drawbacks so far has been there hasn't been a lot of randomized controlled trials comparing the use of virtual reality to other known effective treatments. Um, in this case, the breakthrough was that it was an at-home self-directed virtual reality program used for the treatment of chronic low back pain. Now, we know the number one reason for people to seek health care in the United States is pregnancy. The number two reason for to seek health care is chronic low back pain. And so this is a huge problem driving a lot of people to the physician over the, over the years and with the lifetime cost of care being in the hundreds of thousands or sometimes even millions of dollars. We know that the treatments for this can range anywhere from physical therapy to injections for pain management to sometimes the need for surgery. We also know that many people undergo back surgery and ultimately end up con having continued back pain throughout the course of their lives. So this trial was a breakthrough in that it was the first to show the at-home use of virtual reality for the treatment of chronic low back pain and successfully decreased the patient's, both their subjective sense of pain, but also decreased the amount that the pain interfered with activities of daily living, with the emotional you know, depression or anxiety related to pain, as well as decreased the amount of time they spent thinking or worrying about the pain. Um, I have to agree with you. I, I Before my current job, uh, I worked with a company um, that created digital health interventions, and this was earlier on, and there wasn't many randomized controlled trials out there at all. So you really stood out if you had a, a randomized controlled trial. Um, so let's talk about that trial a little bit. Can you, did you use an active placebo or treatment as usual as a comparison group? And what were the differences uh, between the groups that received the, the virtual reality therapy versus the other group? So in this case, the, the, the treatment the, was called EZVRX was compared to what we call sham VR, which is when the patients are in a virtual reality headset, but they're not really experiencing virtual reality. It's like they're in a VR headset, but looking at a you know, 2D screen, like a Netflix screen. Um, and even as, so this is kind of the digital version of a placebo. So as compared to even the sham virtual reality experience, what we noticed is a 30% improvement uh, in comparison to sham in the intensity of their pain, roughly 30% decrease in their uh, in interference with sleep, as well as in, in decreased interference with mood uh, and stress. So in other words, as compared to a digital placebo or sham VR, this particular treatment was found to be both effective and durable, at least up to a six months after the study was completed. So just to reiterate, you followed them for six months, at least? after. Yeah, we're, we're, we're continuing to follow them now. So. Oh, 
Okay. That's, that's great. That's, that's important because sometimes they, you know, uh, you want an effect to last as long as possible. I wanted to, you mentioned the opioid epidemic, which obviously is still a huge, huge problem in, in the U S it got worse during the current pandemic. Um, I believe your trial did look at use of opioid medication and also over the counter pain medication. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, this particular trial, that was not a focus of the study to look at, you know, comparison to, you know, reduction in opioids. Um, although that is, you know, planned to get to, to, uh, be studied in additional trials. Um, you know, that kind of is what we call the Holy grail. And, you know, in, in this area of research, what we're looking for is if we can actually show a meaningful decrease in opioid consumption in patients that legitimately have chronic pain, then we're really getting towards, you know, what's, what will be an accepted treatment. One of the things we're studying now is not only the effect, the impact on patients as far as their decreased pain, but also we're studying the impact that it has on, on economic outcomes. Ultimately, the dry, drivers of treatment are, you know, in payers, insurance companies, uh, and they will want to pay something when it works well for them, meaning when it saves them money. So if we can show decreased consumption of healthcare resources by using a relatively affordable at-home VR treatment, then we can really get start to work towards getting coverage from the insurance companies for these things. We know that more than 100,000 Americans die every year from opioid or, or drug overdose. Uh, and you know, a huge portion of these were, are patients that started for legitimate reasons, having real pain and as prescribed by their physicians. When the problem is we don't have any great treatments for pain. You know, we, we prescribe opioids, but they kind of cover up or mask the problem. And while treating the symptoms temporarily, they're under, underneath creating a new problem of opioid dependence and, and sometimes uh, abuse and addiction. Uh, and that's really, you know, going in the, actually in the opposite direction we want to with, with treatments like this. By teaching the skills of mindfulness, meditation, pain neuroscience education, uh, and, and helping the patients to understand the, the underlying reasons for their pain, and by decreasing the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, the kind of fight or flight response, we can help patients to kind of rebuild or rewire their ner nervous system to better deal with the pain and therefore decreasing their actual um, experience of the pain itself, rather than just covering it up with, with medications, which can sometimes be dangerous. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. And this particular um, Ease VRX, is that how, what, you, what you're calling it? Ease? Yes. E okay. Ease VRX. Yes. Ease, ease, yeah. ease VRX. Okay. Uh, it has the elements of cognitive behavioral therapy uh, woven throughout the sessions, if I understood that correctly. And we know that that's a proven um, method to help with chronic pain, but I think it's just important to test test it in different um, digital modalities, you know, such as VR and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so the major advantage that VR has, you know, a, a couple in this case is that number one, it can be done kind of on demand at home. The patient doesn't have to say, okay, I've got to wait for my Tuesday three o'clock session in order to kind of be, you know, in order to make progress, they can do it every day on their own, you know, in virtual reality on demand. What this solves is the problem of scale. You know, we don't have the human resources, the physicians, the psychologists, the clinicians to even make a dent in the mental health crisis in this country. We, we can't even come close. We need the only way to scale beyond this is a digital frontline, digital therapeutics. And in my opinion, virtual and other virtual reality and other immersive therapeutics, as we call them, are the best candidate to be the most likely to succeed in this area. This is because of the way that the brain learns. When we're kind of trying to teach a skill or new knowledge, you know, and we use only cognitive, the cognitive learning system, meaning they're trying to read or watch a two-dimensional presentation on the screen, it creates a bottleneck in the brain. We kind of overload the, the cognitive learning system. However, in virtual reality, because it's immersive and it, therefore experiential, the patient's not just sitting there, you know, thinking about something, they're experiencing the treatment and therefore they're able to unlock not just the cognitive learning system, but the other three learning systems as well, the behavioral, the emotional and the experiential or sensory systems so that therefore the learning curve is accelerated and the patients can learn a new skill. In this case, down regulation of their pain or meditation uh, at a much quicker pace than they could if they're having to wait for their once a week or twice a week sessions. Very interesting. One thing we ran into um, at this, uh, this old company I worked for, um, we did incorporate um, CBT into our programs was adherence. 
Um, but I, and, but I feel like with virtual reality, it might already, um, improve adherence just cause it, just because it's more immersive, but I'm just, I'm curious, um, because you're, you, these people are using these, as you said, at home, which has a great advantage. You could reach more people. You could scale it up. Did, do you think that there's a risk here of, um, running into people, not doing it an adherence problem, or did you build any tools into your program that would increase adherence? So the, the, um, the adherence is definitely a problem with many programs, particularly programs for chronic pain. Um, and you know, one of, there's a few kind of reasons for that. Number one is, you know, convenience that they have to kind of go in and, you know, do something. So if it's at home, it makes it easier. Number two is how easy it is to use. Um, and one of the things that, you know, the early studies, um, you know, working with this system have shown is that it's, you know, according to users of all age groups, it's as easy to use as Google or Amazon. So, you know, that makes it pretty, you know, let, as I say, plug and play. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> plug and play for, for even, even you know, older patients. And one of the things we kind of ran into, ran into, you know, we thought kind of going into this, our just like surface level um, hypothesis was going to be that, you know, the older populations may not tend to, you know, gravitate towards this as much. And whether it's in, the, in this study, in the, in, in the outpatient population, or even in our inpatient populations, we were studying these things for pain and anxiety during, during, during COVID in patients that were isolated. We actually found that the age group didn't really matter. We were treating patients from 18 all the way up to 98. Um, and if the content is both easy to use and enjoyable to digest, then it does really boost adherence. So, you know, an additional thing beyond the kind of ease of use and, you know, let's say immersiveness of the content, the, the, the additional thing is a, a breadth and depth of content. So, you know, patients don't want to keep watching the same thing over and over again. So as you're developing these systems, we have to kind of grow, you know, in medicine, we have a pharmacopoeia. We have, a, you know, 40 or 50,000 drugs available at our disposal. I think that when we'll really start to make a move forward in the VR space, you know, each of these trials is such, is such a, an advance because it allows us to keep going and show further and further evidence, you know, and, and as we mount that, um, we can create a, a broader and broader toolkit or, or bigger pharmacy uh, for use uh, in patients with all different conditions, not just pain, but anxiety, you know, uh, social phobias, post-traumatic right, stress right. disorder. Absolutely. So uh, the depth of content is really important. And that's where, um, you know, I think that uh, sometimes some of the partnerships that are forming between uh, the medical tech, you know, digital startups, as such as Applied VR, which ran this trial, or Behave VR, another one of the leaders in mental health uh, treatment uh, using virtual reality. That's where the partnership between those companies and the medical, the drug companies, you know, Biogen is getting into this and Penumbra is getting into this, some right. of the big medical neurotech companies. They'll really be able to scale and, and increase the depth and breadth of content, which will allow us to reach more and more patients. Right. And I think you touched on such important points there. You need to have the program needs to be user friendly and e easy. So people use it. And then you also need the therapeutic component there that's been tested. So it sounds like you guys have both working for you, which is great to hear. Um, and I, on your website, the, from what I saw of the, the screenshots, it looks, it looks really cool. Like something I'd want to try anyways, just to try it. Um, what are there any particular diagnoses that this one will lend itself to? Is it just lower back pain in general? Yeah, in, in this particular study, um, we screened out patients that had underlying, you know, underlying mental health conditions such, such as depression or pre-existing opioid use disorder. However, um, we've actually kind of are working towards walking that back. In other words, we understand that many patients with low back pain also have comorbid depression or substance use issues. And we want to kind of expand the, the, you know, open the access to patients that, yes, they may have low back pain, but we don't want to necessarily exclude patients that have other underlying conditions, which could be exacerbated uh, by depression or anxiety. So um, I actually think, although we didn't study it in this particular trial, I think Actually, my personal belief is that we may get to the opposite. We may find that patients that have comorbid uh, depression or anxiety or substance use disorders may actually have increased benefit. This is just my opinion. This hasn't been proven yet, but may actually have increased benefit when exposed to CBT in a virtual reality setting because it's, it's available on demand uh, and um, they can go back to the content when they need it. And it helps that, you know, we know that mindfulness and CBT are both useful treatments, whether it's for opioid use disorder or for depression. Absolutely. And I think there's that, what you, what you touched on there, that chicken and egg relationship you know, between lower back pain, fueling depression, anxiety, depression, anxiety, fueling lower back pain. 
Um, Dr. Lewis, that sounds really great. And I want to thank you for your time today. Is there a website if our viewers are interested in learning more about this that they can go to? I'll include the link to the randomized controlled trial for, um, so you guys have it in the podcast description. You know, I, as far as a particular website, there isn't one in particular that I could, you know, I could direct you to other than, you know, Applied VR has a website uh, for, you know, for their products. Uh, Behave VR has a website for their products. Okay. Um, and, and uh, you know, at my institution, uh, Hogue, uh, we're working on advancing uh, the actual research, but also the deployment of these technologies at a broad scale in Orange County, California. Um, and our website is hogue.org backslash VR. Um, and, and there's also more information available at that site. Okay, and I will include that website too in the description so you guys can click on it and find out more. Uh, Dr. Lewis, thank you so much. This sounds really interesting. I wish you all the luck with it. And if you uh, get any more research re results from these studies that you're doing, definitely contact us and come back on. It's really interesting. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me.